Hey y'all, it's Sarah, the social social worker. Thanks for tuning in to today's discussion. So what are you? An intimate discussion on growing up mixed in America. This topic is especially important to me because I identify as a biracial woman and it means so much to me to share the experiences and stories of other multiracial and biracial individuals. Before we get started, I would like to add a few important history notes and definitions for context of this video. According to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, multiracial children are one of the fastest growing segments of the U.S. population. This rise can be attributed to the rise in interracial marriages and relationships. One of the most significant and memorable interracial marriages in American history is the marriage of Richard and Mildred Loving. Their marriage was deemed to be illegal in the state of Virginia. The Lovings took their case to the Supreme Court and in 1967 it was declared that Virginia's anti-miscegenation law was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court ended prohibitions on interracial marriage and dealt a major blow to segregation. Despite the court's decision, however, some states were slow to alter their laws. The last state to officially accept the ruling was Alabama, which only removed an anti-miscegenation statute from its state constitution in the year 2000. Another important definition and historical term is the one drop rule. This means that a single drop of black blood makes a person black. Here are a few more definitions that are essential to understanding individuals of biracial and multiracial descent. Ethnicity. Ethnicity means belonging to a group that shares characteristics such as language, religion, culture, and country of origin. Culture. Culture is languages, customs, traditions, rituals, beliefs, dress, art, and music. Race. Race is a social construct that categorizes humans by characteristics, especially physical characteristics such as skin. And finally, multiracial. Multiracial individuals have biological parents that come from different racial backgrounds. In order to give credit where credit is due, I have linked all of the articles from which I pulled information from for this segment in the description below. Now it's time to meet our panelists. It's important to know that none of us are experts in the biracial or multiracial experience in America, but we are sharing our experiences in the most honest form possible. We appreciate you listening and look forward to hearing other stories as well. Please feel free to share in the comments after this video. Our first panelist is Casey McGeorge. Casey McGeorge, 41, is a 17-year military veteran currently working for the United States Post Office as a mail carrier. He has lived throughout the country during his time in the U.S. Army. Casey also has a passion for photography. Our next panelist is Sarah Gibson. Sarah Gibson is an industrial engineer and a content creator. She recently started her Natural Hair page, an educational, humorous platform to get resourceful information on how to manage your afro-textured hair. She also does product reviews and natural hair tutorials. Sarah is very passionate about teaching women of all ages to embrace their hair in their natural state while bringing cultural awareness. She is a biracial woman of Black and Mexican descent. She hopes to inspire individuals with a biracial and mul or multiracial background to embrace their cultural and historical background by her personal experiences. Sarah loves spending time with her dogs and doing outdoor activities. Jennifer Patrick is our third panelist. Jennifer Patrick is a first-generational biracial female of Hispanic and Afro-Caribbean descent. Her mother migrated from Villahermosa, Tabasco, 
and her father is from Port of Spain, Trinidad. Jennifer obtained her bachelor's and master's degree in social work and is now a licensed master social worker and psychiatric therapist. She has a passion for helping individuals find their true selves and is skilled in assisting her clients, including children, adults, and families with traumatic abuse history, chemical dependency, and depression. Outside of work, she provides children facing adversity with strong, enduring relationships and has mentored at-risk youth for seven years. Jennifer assisted in launching one of the first site-based mentoring partnerships for LGBT youth in the nation and has served as an officer and board member for multiple organizations, including the Black Student Union and the League of United Latin American Citizens. Jennifer has a five-year-old daughter, Isabella, and together their hobbies include hiking, learning new languages, playing the piano, and exploring new places. Last but not least, our final panelist is Courtney Horace. Courtney Horace earned her Bachelor of Science in English from the United States Military Academy at West Point, where she was a four-time Division I volleyball player and two-time team captain. In college, she volunteered for multiple nonprofit organizations in New York City and taught inner-city students on her weekends. social social worker and today I have four awesome individuals with me today and we're gonna have an intimate discussion on growing up mixed in America and talking about our different biracial and multiracial identities and I can't wait for you guys to get to meet them so our first guest is Casey and I'm gonna have each of our guests Courtney Jennifer and Sarah introduce themselves Hi everyone, uh, I'm Casey. I'm a 17 year military veteran. I currently work for the post office as a mail carrier. Um, I personally have right now identify as a black man. Um, I'll be honest, I've gone through a few different thoughts on that as I've gotten older. I'm 41 now, so when I was 21 and 30, it was probably a little bit different. Awesome. Thank you. Next we have Courtney. Hi everyone, I'm Courtney. I just graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point and I'm currently enrolled for my master's in public administration at the University of Colorado Denver. And I would say I identify as mixed, but I've kind of gone back and forth with that depending on the situation and who my friend groups are at the time, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more of that, but I definitely identify as mixed. Awesome. Next we have Jennifer. Hi, so I'm Jennifer. Um, I am living in San Antonio, Texas, and I am a social worker. Um, I identify as Mexican and Trinidadian, so biracial. Um, and I think a lot of my surroundings and growing up have really um, shifted my identity. And I think a lot of that has changed over the years as well, um, kind of like what Courtney and Casey have mentioned. Um, and as they did, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more as well. Oh, awesome. Thank you. And next we have Sarah. The other Sarah, my Tokaya. Yes, Tokaya. Hi, everybody. <laughs> my name is Sarah Gibson. I'm 23 years old. I'm an industrial engineer. I graduated last year from NMSU, go Aggies. <laughs> and I identify as both um, Mexican and Black. 
when I was little, I mainly identify myself as Mexican because I grew up with my mom and that's my Mexican side of the family. But now that I'm older, I definitely identified as biracial, both black and Mexican. I embrace both of my cultures. And I'm sure we're gonna get more in depth about it when we talk with more questions. Definitely. And I guess I should probably say um, I identify as a biracial woman. Um, my mom is Caucasian and my father is Black. Um, so part of the reason I wanted to hold this discussion today is to talk with people who have gone through some similar but also very different experiences and help people who are trying to form an identity um, now, especially when we kind of feel like we're either one thing or another. And I want to promote that it's okay to be more than one thing. So I really appreciate you guys being here today. And um, I just want to say that not every biracial or multiracial person's experience is the same. And I personally don't think myself as a spokesperson on the biracial or multiracial experience. And so anybody that's watching this today, just take our experiences with a grain of salt and know that your experiences matter as well. Um, so I kind of want to touch again on talking about what's shaped our identity. I know Casey, you, you said that you identify as a black man, but going throughout your life, it's shifted back and forth. So if you can kind of touch on that and what's um, brought you to the identity of being a black man. Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm 41. I grew up in the Northeast in uh, upstate New York and Massachusetts. Um, my mom was Caucasian. My dad was black. Um, and I was always considered mixed or a term I got a lot in the 80s was mulatto um, as a kid. And uh, I grew up in a really diverse area. It was a lot of different people. Um, from a lot of different backgrounds, but you were always a little different than each group of people in, in whatever different background. Um, it was always one difference. You're a little darker than one. You're a little lighter than another group. Um, you go over different friends' houses, and some things are different from how you grew up for one reason or another, so on and so forth. Um, so I, I joined the army at 17. Um, that was a whole different experience. Um, still consider myself mixed or, or whatever. And then just as you, as I grew up and I realized, yeah, I share experiences with a lot of different people out there. But the one common experience I always dealt with was the experience of being a black man. The experience of some people would look at me and hold their purse a little tighter. Some people would look at me and walk across the street. Or as I'm walking along, I would hear car doors lock from out of nowhere. Um, I, you know, I've been followed around stores uh, because people would think that uh, obviously I was going to steal something from the store or I didn't belong in certain places. Um, I've been pulled over a couple of times, nothing bad, obviously. Nothing near anything that anybody's really dealing with now. But there's always been that fear in the back of my mind that that could happen. Um, and I have, I've, I've been in the back of a car with someone else. And we were all four of us in a car. We're coming from the same place. We're going to the same place, obviously. We're in the same vehicle. Um, but I got questioned in the back seat more than the two white guys I was with in the front seat did. Um, so that, that, I mean, once again, that's just my experience. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. So Courtney, you want to kind of talk a little bit about what's shaped your identity? Yeah, so I think I, so I grew up in about six different states. My parents were always moving around a lot. So I think it depended on the community I lived in. Like when I lived in around the DC area, which is very a, a very Afrocentric community, Growing up, I didn't really have that issue of forming my identity. I would just associate myself with African American. I was like, okay, I'm black because most of my friends were black. And then when I moved to like Seattle, Washington and a couple other communities where I was almost forced to kind of decide who I was. And I think a lot of 
my identity, especially when I was younger before high school, a lot of my identity was shaped by like my friend groups. And I remember like the first time I told my mom I wanted to like straighten my hair because I was like, mom, my hair does not look like all these girls' hairs. Like, please give me bangs. And that was the worst decision <laughs> I ever made. <laughs> I had my mom like cut my hair because I was like, mom, your hair looks like this. Because my mom's white. And I was like, I want you to make me look like all of them because, you know, like that was my perception of like beauty at that time. I was like, okay, all of my white friends, like they have this pin straight hair. Um, and it wasn't until high school when I moved back to Pennsylvania um, and I really got to know like my Philadelphia family where my dad's from Philly and he's black and um, a lot of my family here and then my friend group in high school was like very diverse. Um, most of my friends were either like Colombian Puerto Rican or they looked like me and it wasn't until high school when I started embracing like my curly hair and parts of myself parts of myself that I identified as black and I kind of started accepting that part of me. Um, and then in college, I, it was the same way. I started accepting more of the black side of me and then now I identify as being mixed. So I think definitely just my friend groups growing up um, and how comfortable I was with thinking about these things. Because when you're like 10, you don't really think about like who I am. Like you have ideas, but you don't really know how to put it into words. So it wasn't until high school when I started to really think about my identity a lot. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. Okay, Ms. Jennifer. Um, so as stated, I identify as Mexican and Trinidadian. And I think that's something that's just always stuck with me since childhood. Um, I always knew I was biracial, but um, it wasn't, it wasn't um, anything that truly shaped me, I think, until I moved to Texas. So like Courtney, I moved around a lot when I was younger. Um, so I did elementary in Kentucky and Kansas, and then uh, middle school in Kansas. Um, in elementary and then it wasn't until I moved to Texas that it really started to shape my identity where I noticed that I was different than my peers um, but I always was true to myself and and felt like I knew who my identity was um, but when you start getting older when you start reaching high school and things like that especially for myself moving to North Carolina um, it was very um, different. It was black and white. And so I went to a school where it was predominantly white. Um, so I just felt a little bit different. Like I just never felt like I fit in with either culture, mm -hmm. um, especially with growing up in the States as well. My parents, um, you know, they both migrated from completely different countries. So being first generational um, in that aspect, I never had any friends that could relate to um, my experience per se, just like the different um, cultural aspects in my household. So that was a little bit different, but um, my identity, I feel like has always, has for the most part, always been grounded in the same. And I have to thank my parents as well, because I feel like they sheltered us from that. Um, and then also um, up until middle school, I always grew up on a military base. So you're surrounded by a lot of diversity and different ethnicities and different backgrounds and things. So I think my, I, I don't know, that was my experience. And I think it was a little bit different. <laughs> and that's okay. I think what's so beautiful about talking to everybody here is that everybody's had a very unique experience and they all come from very unique backgrounds. And really what I want to accomplish today is that whoever's coming from a mixed background, multiracial, biracial background is that their experience shouldn't be diminished because it's not the same as the person that's sitting next to them. It should be celebrated because they are different. And I really appreciate you guys sharing that. So thank you. All right, Sarah. Okay, so my identity, how I identify myself has definitely been shaped along the years. So I grew up with my mom. My mom is Mexican. So when I was little, I identified myself as only being Mexican, especially because I grew up in Mexico and there's no black people at all. My dad was always gone because he was in the military. So, and for me, it was very difficult because my mom is blonde and she has green eyes. So I never had to I never saw myself in anybody else. So like my grandma, she has green eyes, my aunts. So especially my friends, like 
Um, I grew up, everybody was Mexican. So I was like, I'm just Mexican, you know? And I wanted, I was like, I'm just Mexican, you know? Like, I'm not black. And my friends also had to do with me identifying myself as Mexican because when I was in high school, no, middle school, um, I started, you know, developing my identity and I would be like, you know, I am black as well. And they would be like, no, you're not. Like, if you, in order for you to be black, you need to be dark skinned. And I'm like, I grew up confused because I was like, well, maybe I'm not black. And it was until when I was in high school that I started, you know, seeing myself, you know, as I am black as well. And it all started in college when I actually started hanging out with more black people. And for me, it was shocking because I realized I had never hung out with black people before, except for my family. So that definitely was like a shock for me because I was like, how come growing up, I never identified myself as black, you know? So definitely my friend groups had a lot to do with me identifying as only Mexican and society as well. Like I said before, like in Mexico, there's no black people at all. So for them, it was so foreign to see a biracial kid, you know, being like identifying herself as black and Mexican. But now I identify myself as being biracial. So I love fully embracing both of my races. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So we kind of touched on the identity that was shaped going through school, our friend groups. And school is hard for a lot of people, regardless of if you're one race or the other. But in my experience being biracial, it was difficult. So what are some advice that you would give kids, the younger generation, whether they're in middle school, elementary, high school, college, what is some advice that you would give them to help them feel comfortable embracing all sides of them, not just feeling like they have to be one thing or another. And we'll go ahead and start with Casey. Uh, for me, I, I would say have an open mind. Um, like I said, I, my mom was Caucasian, my, my dad was black. So I grew up with a lot of different music in the house. Um, friend groups were a lot of different people. So I, I, I was able to listen to a lot of different types of music, uh, types of food. Um, I understand as a kid and when you're young, you're still learning not only who you are, but about the world. So that's a good time to maybe try different things, open your mind to listening to different music, trying different foods, see what you like, um, to see what you're open to. Um, don't close yourself off from anything. Um, as a kid, because if you close yourself off when you're young, I believe that's going to stay with you and it's going to be harder to open yourself up to those things as you get a little bit older. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, so I would say my one piece of advice would be to not be afraid to have conversations with people about identity and about your experiences because I think that was something I sh shied away from because I was like okay is this taboo to kind of talk about you know what my experiences are because how can I expect you know my white group of friends to understand what I'm going through but it's not you don't have conversations to get people to like understand your position necessarily you just have conversations to like open yourself up because you never really know um, what other people are going through as well and I think opening conversations up, especially in like middle school and high school is important because then you, you know, you gain a different perspective. Um, you gain a relationship with people by like being vulnerable with them about your experiences. And I think it makes other people aware as well, because there are those people who, unless somebody tells them like, hey, I don't like when you say like you don't act black or you don't act white. Um, if I would have spoken up, you know, in middle school and told those people, like, how that made me feel, then they might not have still been saying that, you know, 10 years later. Um, so I think that's definitely important to be able to have those conversations with people, not in a way of, like, hey, let me teach you about this, just in a way of, like, hey, like, these are my experiences, and this might not make me comfortable, but I'm willing to open up and have this conversation because you're my friend and I care. Definitely. Thank you. 
So if I had a piece of advice, um, I definitely agree with what both Courtney and Casey said. Um, but I think um, with having an open mind, um, it's important to know who you are as well. And I think growing up, sometimes you really just don't know that. Um, but you kind of have that feeling inside that something's a little bit different. So in that case, I think it's really important to start um, opening up and being honest with yourself, you know? Um, and then also uh, not to be overly sensitive about things because I can recall um, in middle school and high school um, being called certain things amongst my peers and my friends, uh, but not taking it personally, you know? Um, and I think everyone is in the stage of learning, um, especially now in the climate that we are in today. And I, I think it's wonderful and I think it's great. Um, but at the same time, a lot of what's happening is still new, you know, for, especially for the state. Um, so I think it's important, one, to, to educate people, educate yourself, and just be aware of who you are. But like I said, sometimes you don't always know who you are. So just embracing all of who you are and knowing that everything about you is good and enough. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so my advice on younger generations with a biracial and multiracial background would definitely be to don't try to fit in, you know, don't try to fit in, don't let society shape you into who they think you should be. Um, definitely embrace who you are and don't allow people to tell you what you are and what you're not. Definitely stand confident in your own personality and your own background. And just, I wish somebody would have told me when I was younger, don't try to fit in, you know, because I always wanted to look like my friends. You know, I always wanted to have straight hair, have um, green eyes, you know, long straight hair with braids. So definitely just embrace who you are, you know. So that would be my advice. Thank you. So go, circling back to identity, um, what are some things that have, have kind of shaped uh, like your cultural beliefs or your traditions? Like because we're coming from different ethnic backgrounds or racial backgrounds, what, what has shaped like, oh, I'm gonna celebrate this or I'm gonna uphold this tradition? Casey, if you wanna start. Uh, for me, it was, it was probably my mom. Um, I grew up in a single parent household and then I went through a bunch of different foster homes until uh, eventually I was adopted when I was 12. Um, but uh, that was pretty much all I had. So we, we just kind of kept everything simple and celebrated only like the basic holidays. Um, there was nothing really different as far as celebrations or anything we did. So all I had was basically just what I grew up with. Uh, that's just me, myself. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of us end up with being products of our environment. So when it's celebrated around you, it's kind of things that you adapt. May I ask the question? Yeah, of course. Oh, all right, Casey, I just feel like your story is very interesting having grown up in different foster homes. But how, I mean, how was that? Uh, like your, your adopted parents, like did they embrace your culture? Well, that's different because, well not different. It's interesting because I actually got adopted by a black woman and I, and I ended up being um, in a black family. Um, made things, I don't wanna say weird, but different because uh, it started as a, it started for me as a foster home, and then I, like I said, I got adopted. I ended up staying there, and that's the lady who I consider my mom. But that's also at a really weird time. I think I was like twelve, so that's when you're really going through adolescence. You're trying to figure out who you are. There's just all kinds of crazy stuff going on um, in your body, in your mind, school, everything else. Um, And th that was weird in some ways because some of the things that I knew or grew up with 
they looked at as weird. They looked at as different. Um, I got a lot of times, a lot of the comments I got were, don't bring that white stuff into this house. Mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. Just because of different ways that, like I said, I was brought up or things that I experienced. Um, and it, I mean, when you're 13, you hear stuff like that. Sometimes you don't necessarily know how to process it. Um, you don't understand where you came from, uh, the household you grew up in, but it's also like, that's, that's all I knew. Like, like, that's all I know. So what am I doing wrong? Sometimes they don't want to tell you what you're doing wrong. It's just, they laugh at you or, or do whatever. And then you're just kind of like, okay, well, I'll just go over here by myself then. And then you just kind of end up in your own little world doing whatever it is that you normally do. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you for sharing that. And Jennifer, thank you for asking that question. I think it really added an extra element to our discussion and stuff for people to think about. Um, and then I, when we circle back to Casey, um, we're gonna kind of talk about what parents can do to support children who grow up in multiracial or biracial, support children who are multiracial or biracial. And um, I'd really like to hear your perspective on how adoptive parents or foster parents can help children who are in similar positions as you. So thank you for sharing that story. Um, Courtney, if you wanna go ahead and touch a little bit on your, um, what has kind of shaped your cultural beliefs, your traditions, um, and where you've pulled those from. Yeah, so I think for me, I've always been more connected to my Black side because my parents, so when my parents first got married, my mom got like kicked out of the house for like three years. So she didn't talk to her side of the family for like that, a lot. it was a pretty long time, like three years is a long time to not speak to your parents or your side of the family. Um, and that was like right before they got married. And I think when they got officially got married, my grandparents were like, okay, like, it's serious now. Um, and they've been working on that relationship ever since. But I think even today, there's still um, not tension, but you can tell because my, my mom, I mean, I went seven years without seeing like my mom's side of the family. So I kind of grew up connected to and having the traditions of my dad's black side. So we would always go to like cookouts in Philly um, and I'm closer, like I text my cousins um, from Philly all the time, but I, I went seven years without seeing, you know, my mom's side of the family, which thinking back on it now, I kind of wish um, it were different, but at the same time, I also felt like I had to respect, you know, my mom's wishes. And I think it's just, it added an interesting dynamic because now it's like trying to play catch up yeah. and really get to really get to know my mom's side of the family a little bit but most of my traditions and the culture that I've learned definitely comes from my dad's side of the family. Thank you for sharing that. I'm interested to we're going to talk a little bit about when you realize that what it was like growing up in a biracial home so I'm interested to learn more about that experience. Okay Jennifer. Um, so for myself with traditions um, and just, you know, cultural background, um, although I've always identified with both, I feel like I'm much more in tune with my Hispanic side. Um, and I think that really stems from my mother. Uh, she comes from a really big family and they're all really close. Um, so growing up and spending a lot of time in Mexico, it kind of just became um, something that we embraced within our whole family, including my dad. Um, we don't really have any um, family members in the States other than my uh, father's mother and stepbrother. Um, so my um, Afro-Caribbean side, we never really did much to celebrate. So I don't know a whole lot about that side of my um, my race other than you know like carnival and, and big things like that but um other, i mean i really was in tune like i said with my hispanic side um and for the longest time i like sarah i i you know like that was a part of who i was like that's what i knew more of and i really appreciated that growing up um and i feel like what casey mentioned earlier i kind of shut myself off 
to my um, Afro-Caribbeans, I just, cause like, I didn't know anything about it. And so now as I'm getting older and I'm learning about it and I'm trying to instill those things in my daughter, um, it kind of, you know, you regret not knowing more about it. But, um, but yeah, that, that's what it was like for me. <laughs> So for myself, since I grew up in Mexico, I've always been more in tune with my Mexican side of the family. And I grew up, you know, in school with family and in school, they've always instilled the Mexican traditions to me. So I've always fully celebrated them and embraced them even until now. And that's, and for example, when I was old, when I got older and I started, you know, getting more in tune with my dad side of the family, that's when I started to learn more about my, you know, my other culture. So, but growing up, definitely, I was more in tune with the Mexican traditions and everything. Yes. Sorry, right, I'm muted. It's so cool to hear about everybody's different um, cultural backgrounds and traditions. Um, I always thought I was kind of generic because I just did what my mom did, the typical Christian and American holidays. But I mean, it's still part of culture, so it's something to be proud of. But I'm, appre I'm appreciative of you guys sharing your stories with me. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, now that we've talked about how we've instilled our cultural beliefs, um, traditions, I want to talk about um, parenting advice or what advice you would give for an interracial couple or an adoptive family or a fostering family that is um, raising a biracial or multiracial child. I think it's something important to talk about and especially with biracial and multiracial um, children being like one of the largest growing populations in the United States. It's something that I think potential parents should be aware of and what they can do to enrich their children's lives. So Casey, if you want to start. Uh, one thing I would say is uh, embrace, embrace both sides um, of where that child comes from at an early age. Um, don't shut one side off. Um, uh, understand that you know the experiences that we've gone through uh, as far as shutting ourselves off or not knowing where we have come from or anything um, future generations can change that just by being more open about things um, sometimes even though families may not approve or um, as someone said you know they, they didn't have a lot of contact with their family for a, a very long period of time um, there's still ways around that to still embrace that side of that person's culture and this, uh, to, to learn where they come from, to learn their history and, and their experiences and, and as well. Um, and then try not to give that child just one experience growing up because as they get older, they will be curious and they will explore and wonder, you know, a, why was I only why was I only exposed to one side of something, um, as well as what is over here, um, you know, and and I just think that's really important. Definitely, thank you. Yeah, so I have never raised a child, <laughs> but um, so I'm interested to hear what Jennifer has to say about raising a child because it's definitely one of the most important and I can imagine challenging and rewarding experiences. But I think, um, so part of me thinks that you would want your child to obviously like learn things on their own um, and discover who they are on their own. But like Casey said, there are those parts that you want to expose your child to, you know, both sides of your culture. And I think that's something that, you know, looking back on it now, not necessarily, I wasn't necessarily like gypped of my experience, um, my mother's side of that culture, because I think I learned a lot through my friends, through my white friends growing up too. Um, but I think, yeah, definitely when I raise a child, whether they're biracial or not, like I definitely would want to expose them to both sides of the culture. 
um, and let them form their identity because they're already going to experience different things that is going to shape their identity and who they are and who they want to be really. So I think just exposing them to those cultures will at least give them like a background and allow them to form their identity. So, I mean, they're still gonna have identity issues. Like they're still gonna have these questions regardless, but I think giving them and providing them with both cultures will allow them to kind of come up with it on their own and be able to ask you questions, which I think is important too. Like I wish I would have talked to my parents more about, you know, what I was experiencing with my identity earlier on than, you know, high school. Yeah, so like what was already mentioned, I think it's important to embrace both cultures or all cultures because sometimes you can be biracial, but you have a parent who is already biracial. So then you're like, you know, mixed with all these other things. So I think it, it's really important um, from a young age um, just to start implementing and you know, your daily lives. Um, I think a really cool thing is books. I mean, that is like the number one tool. And I think reading um, and really just educating yourself is important. And it can be made into fun activities, especially for children. I know that's what I do with my daughter. Um, so we'll read a book. Um, so for example, um, tamales. So we read a book about tamales and then we'll go buy tamales and we'll eat them or we'll learn how to make them or something like that, you know? Um, but I think it's really important just through music, just through holidays um, and everything. And not only um, teaching children about their own cultures, but other cultures around them. I mean, for example, we live in Texas and San Antonio where it's predominantly Hispanic. And although I am Hispanic, um, it's important to learn about your different cultures um, that are surrounding you. Or if we were anywhere else, um, if it was like a heavily just anything else like it, it's just important to embrace everything and and just educate your children and i think also just like with the climate of today i think sheltering them a little bit as well and giving them what is age appropriate um in terms of what they can understand because i've been seeing a lot of videos trending online lately because of you know everything that's going on and rightfully so but um, I've seen some where they're having conversations with children as young as my child, five years old, about, you know, police brutality and, and things like that. And, and while it's okay to educate your children, I think it's very important to be mindful of, you know, their cognitive ability because, you know, you may think your child is mature enough, but developmentally, they don't know how to process that yet. So just really keeping in mind age appropriate context when talking to them as well. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to Courtney, too. I was muted, but I appreciate your input that you gave. So thank you, Jennifer and Courtney. All right, go ahead, Sarah. Jennifer, I really like what you said, especially you because you have a kid about, you know, telling parents to find books so your kids can see. I definitely think finding books and media so your child can, you know, See themselves in a book and media I think that's definitely important I would have loved growing up seeing you know reading a book with a girl with big hair you know I think that would have definitely changed the game for me when I was growing up and how I felt about myself I think another thing that's very important is exploring the world if you have the opportunity of getting to travel and visit your you know every family members and really you know dig in the tradition of your ancestors i think that's definitely important as well as fostering their language you know make sure that you know you instill in your child your the language that runs in your family so that way future generations can carry on that legacy and i will also say that you know talk about their cultures always make sure to talk about their cultures and follow their traditions you know even though you may not be celebrating the same traditions, teach your kids about it and make sure to celebrate them as well so they grow up with that. That's awesome, thank you. And while we're on the topic of education, um, Sarah, you're like the hair queen. So can you give us some tips of how people who have natural hair um, or 
ready to take that journey on the natural hair experience. How can we start to educate ourselves and make sure that we're find, finding reputable sources? Because there's so much online, so many YouTubes, Instagrams, but not every hair texture is the same. And I love what you're doing with your Instagram page about educating about different hair textures and hairstyles. And I think it's really important to share with people who are biracial, multiracial, or people who are parents of biracial or multiracial children. Definitely. So I'm a huge natural hair advocate and I can be talking about hair literally all day. <laughs> so definitely, for example, in my personal experience, my mom didn't know how to do my hair. I barely learned how to do my hair when I started going to college. I absolutely hated my hair growing up. You know, I would tell, you know, ask God, God, why are you punish me with this hair? You know, like, I just want to have straight hair. It's much easier. I just want to look like everybody else. So I would say the first step as a parent is definitely instilling, like telling your kid, your hair is beautiful. You know, you don't need to have straight hair in order for you to be beautiful. And I think for me, that was a huge part because in my personal experience, you know, my mom, she has straight hair. And I think my mom never really discussed those difference that I was going to have with society because she wanted to protect me. She didn't want to make me feel like her and I, we had differences. She was always like, you know, you're my daughter. And the reality is we both have social differences and it's okay, it's normal. It's, it's you have to normalize those differences. So definitely the great advantage that we have nowadays is social media. Social media now is booming. Like we're literally have so much information on the internet so i feel like right now it's very easy for you to go and look for different resources so if i you know if i would go back in time and if i could give um if i would you know find my mom and be like you know this is what you need to do with your child i would definitely be you know talk about you know tell her you know she's beautiful with her hair and also just research, definitely research, um, ask around, don't be shy to ask around. People are more than happy to share tips and experiences. And I know for my mom, what she did, you know, I remember when we were at Fort Bliss and I was little and she would, you know, look for, she would see black women on the hair aisle and then she would be like tapping on their shoulder and she would be like hey you know like she would be desperate I don't know what to do with my daughter's hair like I really need help what products do you use so definitely take into consideration that even though for example I have black hair my hair is mixed hair so it's definitely a difference on treating black hair from mixed hair so make sure to research online there's a bunch of articles blogs natural hair bloggers YouTube videos Instagram blogs a whole bunch of information. So for example, how I started my journey, when I look back, I just, I laugh about it because, you know, I started when Instagram started to be a thing. I remember I got my account and I was like, I saw this hair blogger, which is my favorite one up until this day. Her name is Taryn Guy. I don't know if you guys have heard about her. And I saw her hair, you know, big hair. And I was like, oh my gosh, like we have the same hair texture. And I became obsessed and I told my mom, I need to get a haircut. I need to get my hair shaped. I remember I would be playing around like in the mirror. I would be like, okay, like, you know, like this up and stuff. And I emailed her. I was like, hey, Taryn, you know, and I didn't think she was gonna email me back, but she did. And I was like, you know, our hair textures look very similar. Uh, can I get some tips? Like what hair products you use? Mind you, you know, for me, I never thought about getting on YouTube, uh, looking for any type of information. And she was so nice that she emailed me back with the full detailed, you know, list on what to do, YouTube videos, everything. And that's, you know, it was like a mind opening experience. I was like, what the hell? Like, there's so much stuff into hair. I was like, yes, get into it. So, you know, I started watching a bunch of YouTube videos, hair blogs. So definitely, you know, now in 2020, it's way easier to look for information. You literally just have to type on YouTube, you know, you know, type this hair, know your hair type, know your 
porosity levels. Also another advantage that we have, and also I use that advantage is that there's a lot of hairstylists that, you know, they have Instagram accounts and I message them, you know, I DM them. I'm like, you know, what do you think about this hair product? Or sometimes if I have an issue with my hair and they actually answer to you. So we just have that, you know, that connection, such an easy connection that we can make with, you know, just everybody that has social media. So definitely take advantage of it. So that would be my, my tip for, you know, multiracial, biracial kids that, you know, right now they're like, I just don't know what to do with my hair. Definitely use your resources, YouTube, YouTube, blogs, articles, there's everything in there. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I've seen Sarah's hair all forms. We went to college together, but I think it's so fabulous and beautiful. And I follow her on Instagram all the time. She's always like, use this or use that. And this will make your curls pop. And I'm like, okay, whatever, curl queen. Um, I, really, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I want to kind of talk about, we've talked about a lot of, um, well, not a lot, but we've touched on some of the challenges that have come with being a biracial or multiracial individual, but I want to highlight the strengths. I want to highlight the positivity of how awesome it can be to be a person of two or three or multiple cultures. And I want to just hear what your strengths have been or what you find as a strength of being a biracial or multiracial person. And we'll go ahead and start with Casey. Uh, I don't know. For me, I, I it, it's hard to say, really. I mean, not not that there isn't any strengths, but um, I've never really looked at at, at it in that way, or or to try and say, uh, you know, this this makes me special, this makes me great, or this is something I really appreciate about it. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that one. Not, not, not that there's not any. I just don't know if I can for me. And that's okay. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. I think um, a couple of different things that I thought of now, just coming to terms with my identity all throughout college and really reflecting and thinking about it more. I think one big thing is that I found that I'm more flexible um just in general in life like I've learned how to like adjust on the fly with a lot of different things um and I've also been able to to connect with people from very diverse backgrounds because not that I know necessarily what they're going through but I think people that have had these identity issues like whether you call it an identity crisis or not people that have had to come to terms with you know, their identity or have had these struggles um, sometimes for like 20 plus years of who they are, um, whether it be like sex, race, gender. Um, I think a lot of people who have these struggles with identity, you can kind of empathize with them in a way. And I think coming to terms with my own identity has made me more empathetic to my friends who are also going through identity issues. Um, no matter if it's with their race or not, I think it's allowed me to kind of connect with people um, from different backgrounds. Um, I, like I said, I'm a little bit more flexible and open-minded, I think, um, than some of my peers, just in terms of like me be, being willing and having an open mind to new experiences, just because I have like the different cultures at play and I kind of, I know that it's okay to have different experiences and I know like it's good it's a good thing to be different and to have different experiences awesome. thank you I actually really liked what Courtney said um, because it's really true I think you really do learn how to adapt uh, a lot easier um, than your peers uh, and I actually read that in a study a few years back and, and that's kind of when it really hit me and it's kind of helped I think in every aspect of life especially um, with work and different things like that but I honestly relate more to Casey and that it's very not that there's not any strengths but it was it's very difficult for me to to find a strength for myself personally and that I've never um, really thought about it in that way. Um, 
I think I've had to overcome a lot more challenges. Um, and I think because of that, it's made me a stronger person. Um, so I think that in the end could be considered a strength. Definitely, thank you. So for myself, being biracial is definitely one of the best aspects of my life. And I found a lot of strengths on being biracial, like having the opportunity of seeing and experiencing the beauty and richness of both of my cultures, as well as, like you said, Courtney, like being able to, to connect with more people with diverse backgrounds and also being empathetic of other people's experiences on their backgrounds. I know for myself, you know, in college, you meet people from all around the world. So definitely, I've always felt very connected with people with different cultural backgrounds because of my cultural backgrounds. So definitely for me, it's like, I, it has definitely opened my mind to an extent where it's like, I know people, there's sometimes people don't get to that point of being open-minded to that extent. So yeah, that's my, that's my personal experience. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, this, so this next question, I know we were kind of like on a happy note um, and please feel free. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Um, but in my personal experience, um, being biracial has affected personal relationships, whether it be with friends or um, romantic relationships. And um, one that I will always remember and it will always have an impact um, on me is when I was dating somebody, um, they were getting ready to take me home and their grandparents were a little unsure. I mean, I guess you can say they were, were racist. I mean, there's no other way to put it, but they were not okay with him dating a black girl. And what he said to her was, oh, she's like black, but not really. Her mom's white. And it really hurt me because one, they weren't gonna accept me for the person that I am. And two, why does my mom being white make me any better than the other black girl that he might've brought home? So I think when you think about it or you think of like different things that people have said, like, oh, like you're an Oreo, you're black on the outside and white on the inside or things like that, that you try not to take too personally, but as you go through life, you realize like not everybody is as open-minded as you. And um, if any of you have had a, an experience like this with friendships or relationships um, and you'd like to share or just give some advice on how somebody in a difficult position can handle this, um, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, I've, I've had a few. Um, uh, in high school, I actually had a parents who pulled their daughter out of school and transferred her to another school for dating me. Um, so as like a 15 year old, that can be kind of a traumatic experience. Um, we've since reconnected and, and obviously I know it wasn't her fault, but um, their parents were racist. There's really no other way to put it. Um, I've had friends on both sides uh, who, who have made comments like that of either, oh, well, he's not really black or I actually had an ex-wife because there were a few movies I hadn't seen um, that said I wasn't black enough. Um, obviously, that marriage was already on the decline, and that was kind of one of the things that kind of said, eh, maybe this one isn't really worth it, but it's beside the point. Um, my advice would, I, I guess, would be to, to stand up for yourself and say something. Um, to say either that's not cool, that's not right, that makes you feel uncomfortable. Um, because the more you allow it to go on, the more they're going to continue to think it's okay to say those things. The more they're going to continue to say, to think, oh, I'll, well, I was only joking. I didn't mean it that way. And the more they're going to continue to do it to you and they're going to do it to other people. And then that, it kind of spreads from there. Um, 
my my question for you guys as women um that i was curious about have you guys had any experiences being uh multiracial where maybe you were objectified a little more or um looked at in a much different way than women on other sides of the spectrum feel free to answer in any order um and then i'll share my thoughts after i i mean i think all of us immediately when he said that <laughs> We all started like, yeah. Um, and I've gotten that since I was a child. I mean, every day when I went out with my mom, you constantly hear it. Oh my gosh, you're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. And it kind of sticks with you. And it, it, it kind of messes with your self-esteem a little bit because as you get older, it's like the day you don't hear it, it's like, oh, it's something wrong with me, you know? Um, but I mean, I've, always heard it I'm like oh you look so exotic like what are you and um it's just and and sometimes I feel like uh you you kind of get passes with things a little bit I mean because like you said you you you're, we're just objectified I feel like we're really different and I don't think growing up I didn't have any mixed friends so I was kind of like the rare breed you know I mean I was called a mutt and I'll get into that a little bit later um when I address your other question but yeah definitely Sarah I see you snapping down there do you have uh something that you want to add <laughs> <laughs> no definitely because that was that was like an amen yes definitely um I agree with um, you know, answering to Casey's question and agreeing to what Jennifer said, it's definitely weird when people, you know, look at you, you know, and it's kind of like even how they look at you. It's kind of like you're just so exotic, like, and they become so invested in you. And from my experience, it's just kind of like, like, it just kind of makes you like, you know, what's you know, they kind of like, you know, the questions they start asking, and it just makes you feel weird, you know, for example, and it also, um, in my, in my personal experience, you know, with strangers, or even my friends, or acquaintances, you know, people when they get to know me, sometimes they, you know, they see that I look different from everybody else in Mexico. So they ask me, so what are you? Like, you know, they're so curious, you know, explain yourself and as well because I'm with my mom and my mom, they think she's my friend because, you know, they would never, you know, in a million, you know, times they would think that she's my mom. So I explained to them my cultural background and they're just kind of like when I mentioned, oh, I'm half black, half Mexican, they just kind of like their faces change. It's just like a very weird feeling, you know, they just kind of like, oh, and it just makes me, you know, feel very self-conscious about myself. Like, what is it about, you know, why can't you accept that I'm both, you know? So especially being a woman and when people try to objectify you, it, at least for myself, it definitely messes you up for, to a certain extent because you're like, I can't just be seen as, you know, embrace my differences just the same way I embrace yours. Yeah, I definitely related to what Sarah and Jennifer were saying, um, and especially on Jennifer's point of just being called like, oh, you're so beautiful, you're so beautiful, but I think it got to a point where I think it's hard not feeling like you're accepted from both sides. Um, like, if I had, for example, I would have, like, white guys, they're like, oh, wow, you're such a pretty black girl, and I'm just like, okay, like, they're not getting the point. I don't, I think, like, you meant that as a compliment, but that's not a compliment to me, and then I would have, I didn't really have it with my family as much, more of like extended family at like cookouts and stuff. They'd be like, oh, the light girl. Um, and I got that from my black side. And I think that kind of affected how I saw myself too, because I was like, okay, do they actually like accept me? You know, like these are people who I look at as family, but they're kind of making slights um, at me just because I have lighter skin than they do. Um, and so I think, especially now with and, I've, and another example of like friendships too, I think um, in high school, I had a, a, vo a volleyball coach whose daughter was on the team with me. 
and I never thought that they were racist at all because they treated me fine. Um, but they, I found out that my friend on the team, her parents wouldn't let her date a black guy. And I was like, well, why? Like, that's weird because I've been over her house multiple times and like her family was so nice to me, but they wouldn't let her date a black guy. And that kind of opened my eyes to the reality that, you know, sometimes you don't even know that people's like, like you were saying, Sarah, like people's grandparents or their parents might have these ideas that are only presented when they're is like a, a serious relationship going on and that's the reality of today um and it's sad that it gets to that point that you don't even know until you go to the family's house like you could be dating a guy and they're like okay cool cool like i respect your culture and then you go to their house and it just kind of feels strange because that hasn't happened to me personally but it's happened to some of my friends where they were like yeah i literally went to their house and like i got stares from like her uncle's um, or his uncles and it just feels odd and I think for me now I definitely if thinking in terms of like romantic relationships I definitely would want someone who I'm comfortable around being myself being biracial and I think I would have to feel comfortable around their family as well because especially when you get into a serious relationship like their family is also your family um, and I think for me, like being comfortable being just myself <laughs> would be so important. I wish I could like, retweet what all of y'all have said, if that was like a virtual retweet Zoom thing. But I, I hear you like loud and clear. I definitely think being light skin is like a blessing and a curse, right? Because you get treated one way, but then you see your friends that are black and they're not getting treated the same way as you. And you're like, well, why not? We're cut from the same cloth. And they're like, oh, well, you're just like so exotic. You're so pretty. And it's like, dude, I'm not like a piece of meat, you know? And I think it's something that I've experienced and it's nice to hear from other women that they've experienced it as well. And in order for that to be not okay, I think we ha need to have more conversations about it and not just allow the media to portray us as like, well, they're the closest thing to like this Eurocentric standard of beauty. So we're gonna hold them on a pedestal because the higher we're held on a pedestal for being exotic or being different, we're placing our brothers and sisters like lower and that shouldn't be how it is we should be celebrating everybody for their differences and their own unique beauties so i really appreciate you guys sharing this um and your experiences with that because it's something that i've experienced so many times through pageants through being in the bartending industry through doing bottle service that i just i wish things would change and i think this is the first step to having those things change so thank you I have a question for you, Sarah. So I know you have black and German descendant. So how was it for you? I know we already, you know, went over that question, but how is it for you with your family's traditions, you know, especially on your German side? How do you, because your mom is, is German, right? So yeah. how did she make sure that she instilled those traditions on your family? And also like if you, do you regularly go to Germany or like how, how, what is the dynamic? Yeah. So it's all, I guess it, my mom, her dad was German. Um, and like, but he was, he, his parents came to America from Germany and then he was the first generation here. Um, so then I, my mom grew up in America. Um, and unfortunately, like my grandpa didn't really share like the language or the culture or the traditions. So all she really had was a last name um, and a few stories, which is really sad because now I want to know more about my culture. And it was kind of like, no, we're not like, I don't know. I can't tell you anything about it and nobody else is alive. So you kind of have to figure it out for yourself. Um, and my dad, he grew up um, late 50s, early 60s uh, in Virginia. So he, 
being a black man in that time, he experienced a lot of things that I can't even imagine going through. And I think that when my brother and I were born, we were sheltered from a lot of that because he didn't have a strong connection with his family back in Virginia. So we were raised in a predominantly white um, area and then we moved to El Paso and I was brown like everybody. So I was kind of just left to my own devices to figure out like, what am I gonna be? So I dated Hispanic guys and I hung out with Hispanic friends and I've kind of adopted that culture and I don't wanna be seen as like culturally appropriating it, but it's like the closest thing that feels like home to me because it's the only thing that I've really been able to self explore because my family's been very closed off about their past. Um, so it's, it's kind of a weird dynamic. I mean, my parents have supported me and they've always told me I'm beautiful and they say, go do whatever you want. But tradition and culture wise, I've kind of had to learn from the environment that I grew up in. And I've just kind of pulled things from different places that I've lived. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for asking. Um, so I, I know Casey answered a little bit about the relationships. Um, did you girls, Courtney, Jennifer, Sarah, would you guys like to add a little bit to that as well? For myself, like uh, right now I'm with my boyfriend and I've never felt, you know, he's black. And I never, I was never afraid, you know, on my Mexican side of the family, like what they would say. Like it was always, I, that never crossed, even, even, even crossed my mind. And he never, ever since the beginning, ever since he started pursuing me, you know, he never saw me being Hispanic as well as something that could get in between our relationship, especially because we both have different religions he's christian and i'm catholic so i was on that aspect i was a little bit afraid because you know in catholicism we have you know these traditions and i was just kind of afraid like he was going to be like no like i don't i don't want to know about it and he's always been very open even if we don't share the same religion he's always you know gone with me to church we've gone to church together to different you know traditions we have along the year so he's i'm just very blessed to have him and he's always so open to know about my family my family's history you know growing up in mexico so i've had a very good experience in that aspect thank you for sharing that sarah okay go ahead you're good. Oh, I, was saying, I, I wish I could say the same. Um, unfortunately, with my past romantic and I have past romantic relationships, um, I've actually struggled a lot just because, um, yes, values, you know, it's good when values line up, right? But I never thought race or culture would ever be an issue. Um, and so I, I've dated black guys in the past. Um, my my daughter's father is actually black as well, but, um, I don't, I, this guy I dated was just so much into, like, black power, um, and everything was just black, 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 and I did not grow up that way, you know, my, like I said, my father's from the Caribbean, so, um, I don't think it was later in life until he started experimenting a lot of those, or experiencing, experiencing a lot of those things as well so I just I couldn't relate like I was aware of the culture I was aware of um, you know like instilling different things in my daughter and teaching her through books and things like that but it was just so weird um you know and it was around the time when the black lives movement started and I did not fully understand it while I supported it I didn't fully understand it and because of that I was made, I was like belittled in a way or like degraded. Um, I don't know, I don't really know how to articulate it quite well, but I mean, I've had people just like in friendships as well who have told me they don't like me because I don't act black. And I don't know what that means to act black, you know? Um, 
And for me, it was really just heartbreaking having to overcome some of those challenges, um, especially in an intimate relationship that I was in where it ended up not working out because of our difference. Um, and I think later on, what Casey was saying, the most important thing is standing up for yourself, right? So I think once I did that, a lot of it stopped, but it's still in the back of your mind. Like this person doesn't fully accept me because of who I am. Um, like they're not willing to embrace me and both of my cultures. Um, so I just felt like it was very unfair for me to have to completely agree and understand one side um, and not having that individual understand where I was coming from as well. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, it did. Thank you for sharing your experiences. I really appreciate that. Courtney, did you want to input anything? Um, so I already spoke a little bit about it, but yeah, I definitely agree with Jennifer. I mean, in a relationship, like you want that complete acceptance of who you are, um, especially something so important as like your own culture. Like that's like the bare, <laughs> that's like the basics. Like you want to be accepted for who you are. Um, and relationships already have a lot of challenges already. So it's like you don't want to fight that battle of trying to, I mean, explain yourself and trying to be understood by somebody that's supposed to be your partner. So I think for me, I've always, um, I mean, everyone has their preferences, but I think for me, if I'm like very early on in a relationship, if somebody, if I can already tell that there are these, you know, differences and maybe they're not really understanding my culture or where I come from, I'm not gonna spend my time trying to, you know, persuade or explain to them. Um, and I think that's just my personal opinion. But I think for me, like, acceptance is so important. And if I already see signs of them not being able to fully understand or accept me, then I'm not going to, at this point in my life, I'm not gonna spend months and years of my time trying to explain to them. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, so we, I feel like we've had a really an intimate and pretty intense conversation and I really appreciate all of you guys sharing your thoughts and opinions and asking questions, staying engaged. Um, I just wanted, before we wrap up, I want to ask each of you what are some things that you are taking away from this conversation and how you can implement that into the community around you. Um, and if you have any final questions, please feel free to ask them um, when we get to you in the circle. Uh, for me, um, it's definitely the embracing of different cultures. Um, I've done that a lot. It's been 17 years in the Army. I've been all around the world. Um, but it's definitely more of just being willing to in, um, embrace those other cultures. Um, not necessarily just my own, not necessarily just uh, the culture of someone I'm with, but the idea of the cultures of everyone around me. I live in Southern California. Um, there's a lot of different cultures around me. Um, his, there's a lot of Hispanic, and then within Hispanic, there's a lot of different cultures within um, Hispanic, if that's correct. And... Uh, through friends and, and people I'm dealing with out here, you learn that there are subtle differences sometimes. And just sometimes those subtle differences to you are a huge difference between each of those cultures. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna second Casey on everything that he said. And I think it's important to remember um, kind of like what he said that you know, just because we say uh, we identify as being like mixed or, you know, biracial, there's so many different, <laughs> like you can be Mexican and black or you can be, um, you know, Dominican and white. Like I have, I've met so many different people from different backgrounds and everyone has these unique experiences, but we never really know until we talk to people um, and form these relationships and form these connections with people to, understand or try to hear out their experiences because I think it's important to hear you know different experiences from your friends because like I said I, I growing up in Pennsylvania I met a lot of people who looked like me but we all have such different experiences um, depending on you know our families like my family might be different from another family even if 
you know, my friend's dad is black and her mom is white. Like we grew up completely different. And I think we, I mean, you can never lose anything by asking people questions and learning more about their backgrounds. And I think that's important, especially in the digital age, like when information is like at the tips of our fingers, um, I think educating ourselves, but also asking the people around us um, and not being shy to ask your friends, you know, some of those intimate, if they're open to it, those intimate questions. Yeah, and I think, Courtney, I think you touched on something that's really important. I, so growing up as a biracial person, for the longest time, I always thought like biracial, okay, black and white, black and white, like those are the mixes. But there's so many different varieties and it's like this beautiful spectrum of multiracial, biracial, you can be mixed with so many things. And I think that what people can take away from listening to this today, even if there wasn't somebody who was represented of their particular mix or race, um, just know that their experience is also valid. And um, I appreciate you mentioning different types of people that you've come across. So thank you for sharing that. I think the number one thing I took away from this is that it's okay to have open discussions about who you are and how you're feeling um, and standing up for yourself. Um, yeah, I think that, like I said, that was the biggest thing I took away. Um, but really just embracing other people and other cultures and having the willing to learn. Thank you. For myself, the biggest thing that I got from this conversation is that it is important to have these type of conversations. And I loved how all of us were very raw and real because I feel like for myself, sometimes I refrain myself to fully saying my experience because I don't want to hurt people's feelings, you know? So I think it's very important to be raw and express yourself because I feel like after this conversation, we all learned something about each other that can help us in the future. You know, if maybe we're in a, in a similar situation and we can be like, oh, you know, Sarah, Casey, Courtney, and Jennifer, you know, I heard that before. So it can definitely help in your personal experience. And also, I think it's very important because I feel like when we were growing up, you know, there were no panel discussions. We didn't see it on social media because social media was not as big as it is now. So definitely, you know, younger generations can definitely look at this video and be like, I can relate to these people. And like Corny and Sarah said, you know, there's so many type of, um, you know, multiracial, um, how can I say it, backgrounds. And I think it's so important, you know, sometimes I see these representations on the internet and I think it's just so beautiful to be able to learn about everybody's cultures. So we have, I feel like we have a responsibility as being biracial and multiracial to teach our peers, teach our families, educate people on, you know, it is important for people to hear about our experiences. So that's what I got out from this conversation. And thank you, Sarah, for, you know, having this open discussion and allowing us to share our personal experiences. Thank you, Sarah. And yeah, I mean, for me, the reason I started this whole platform is because I'm so curious about other people's experiences, whether it be with race, sexuality, um, political engagement, civic engagement. I know that I don't know everything. And so through these open discussions and panels, I get to meet so many people that have such a wealth of knowledge. And my goal is just to share that with as many people as I can. And I really appreciate you guys for participating in this and sharing your stories. And Casey, thank you for hanging out with all of us girls. It really means a lot that you were willing to share your experiences as a man, not only at you're not only as you growing up, but also getting real about relationships, because that's something that I think 
more people need to see is a male who's willing to open up about his experiences. And I really appreciate that. And ladies, thank you as well for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you walked away with a little bit more understanding of those around you. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more discussions on all things social work and social work.